Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Step FM. Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Good evening, listeners. Welcome to All Things Legal. It is our third week, and I am your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. Every week, I will be looking at one legal topic which affects the Jamaican legal landscape. I will also be reviewing some topical legal news items. I wish to remind you that you may suggest topics which have legal implications for discussion on the program. Now, I wish to also underscore the point that this program is not meant to substitute or replace legal advice from an attorney at law, and you should still consult your attorney at law if you have legal issues, even if the facts are similar to those discussed on the program. Again, thank you for listening, and I look forward to sharing with you today. Our local call-in number is 876-453-1444. Or if you are overseas, our international number is 954-338-7973. You can call in or you can WhatsApp in your questions or your comments. I look forward to hearing from you, no matter how unpopular controversial your positions are we look forward to hearing and sharing with each other this evening now we want to move on to the first segment of the program what's in the news what's in the news what legal item of interest came in or news this week one that really jumped out at me was the data breach by Victoria Mutual, their wealth department. And what happened was that in an email, 5,000 client records were leaked by VM Wealth. How would you feel about that? Um, VM Wealth, the Chief Ex Executive Officer of the Investment House, Mr. Rez Burchinson, told the Gleaner that his Human Resource Department had already commenced an appropriate investigation into the dispatch of the email attachment by a staff member reportedly in error to under 200 people. So under 200 people received confidential information related to 5,000 VM Wealth members. They said that the email included tax registration numbers, addresses, contact numbers, Jamaica Central Securities depository numbers of thousands of clients. Mr. Burchinson insisted that the information that was leaked did not include financial data. But it begs the question, could it have was it a, is it a possibility that it could have included financial data? And even if it did not include financial data, are you comfortable with financial institutions um, being, you know, in possession of your information and um, it being subject to human error that that information could be leaked to persons that you did not want to be privy to that information? Human error was the reason that was given by VM Wealth. Now, there is an attorney, Mr. Chuku Mekko Cameron, who is trained in data protection laws, and he believes that VM could possibly face legal liability concerning this leak. How do you feel about this, listeners? What are your thoughts on this leak? Is this something that you're comfortable with? Um, how would you feel if your financial institution, by just some mistake, sent out an email containing your address, your TRN, you know, certain um, 
particulars about you? And do you think that the risk obtains that they could accidentally, by the same token? Well, King, they said that it was a human error. It was entirely by inadvertence. It was not deliberate that they um, sent out this information. And of course, there are times when all of us are overtaken by human error. But what the attorney is, is claiming, this data um, protection attorney is claiming is that these financial institutions, they perhaps need to employ um, what is called encrypted emails or use encrypted attachments so that persons who are sending and are on the receiving end, that they have to have certain keys or codes so that they can access it. And that would reduce the risk um, of, of, of information leaking in this manner. Um, there was another article in the paper this week where he cited an English case where in circumstances where another institution had leaked information where the material was not encrypted, that institution actually faced liability. However, the difference in Jamaica is that our data protection law is still and it's, it's, it has not been passed. The bill is currently still being debated. And um, issues of the whole encryption are certain issues that are, are um, the persons who are responsible or the, 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 um, they're discussing currently know while this bill is to be tabled. So what do you think? How do you feel about that, listeners? How do you feel about the, the potential for your information to be released to unknown eyes or eyes that you did not intend to view your information. You know, people, I guess um, it's a possibility for, for cyber crimes as well. Um, even though in this, in the, on the facts of this particular matter, I, I don't know if VMWealth could be accused of cyber crimes, but um, certainly persons do hack into various institutions um, their their um their systems and access those would be different considerations um but it does raise the question king in terms of um, whether or not there are enough systems in place you know which can you know act as a precaution or some kind of preventative measure against things like these um recurring in the future so listeners how do you feel about that how do you feel about the possibility of your information being leaked by your financial institution? Another item which appeared in the news this week um, concerned um, encroachments. It was in the Sunday paper on the 16th of February, um, the Sunday Gleaner um, this week concerning the issue of encroachments. What... What is the purpose of them sending out that email? Well, it was an accident. It was not deliberate that they had sent it out to um, deliberately to leak that information. It was actually sent to an existing client of the institution and inadvertently they added other information which was not intended to be in that email. Um, so it, it was sent to existing customers of VM Wealth, over I think 200 the article said. So it was not deliberate. So the other news item, thank you for, call, for writing in, listener. That looks like Leo. Now another Another article that came out, as I said before, concerned the matter of encroachments. Now, this is our third program, and we have been looking at various issues related to land and title and um, certain challenges which can be made to title. I mean, in our first week, we looked at restrictive covenants and that, that landmark case coming out of the Supreme Court concerning that development, which was ordered to be demolished on Upper Montrose Road for breaching the restrictive covenant, breaching the conditional approval of the, par the Kingston and St. Andrew um, Municipal Corporation, as well as failing to abide by the terms of that injunction. Now, this week we're looking at the issue of encroachments. Encroachments, this came in an article on Sunday. What is an encroachment? 
So last week we spoke about the validity of surveyors ID reports as well as pre-checked diagrams. You might remember that the pre-checked diagrams, they have a, an, a, a lifetime of how long? Seven years. And the survey ID reports have a, a, a lifespan of one year. Now, on the matter of encroachments, I had indicated to you that encroachments can appear on the face on the face of a surveyor's ID report. Another listener is saying, okay, I was wondering why all of that information was in the email. Yes, indeed, it was a mistake. Hi, Leo. So, the matter of encroachment. What is an encroachment? Land has, has boundaries. Right, especially if you have a title, you have established boundaries, and your neighbor would have established boundaries as well. If your neighbor is building a fence, and the fence causes an encroachment onto your property, or let me not use the word encroachment, if your neighbor's fence crosses your boundary line and takes up a particular portion of your land then that is considered to be an encroachment right now an encroachment it affects title especially if you're going to be seeking a mortgage the mortgage you require requires that you provide them with a surveyor's id report and if the surveyor's id report discloses that there is an encroachment on the title then this is an issue that the mortgagee would require you to resolve before the mortgage is approved in your favor so in view of this encroachment Parties can negotiate payment for this encroachment depending on the size, right? And in those circumstances, the title's office does what is called a part of land transfer, reflecting that the portion which was encroached now forms a part of your neighbor's property. Now, the article touched um, certain issues, a couple months ago, I had this very problematic matter involving an encroachment as well. In circumstances where my client, uh, my client's land was encroached upon by, um, by their neighbor's land. And my clients had a mortgage over their property. Now, my clients proposed, proposed to do what is called a part of land transfer and to sell that encroach section to their neighbor. But because they had a mortgage on their title, they had to get a consent of mortgagee from the institution that granted them the, the, the mortgage. And they also had to get what is called a partial discharge of mortgage. What that means is that the mortgage company, whether it is NHT, whatever financial institution it is, they would discharge the mortgage for that area which is the subject of the encroachment because that section would no longer form a part of your title. You would be transferring it to your neighbor's title. And the mortgagee had to submit those documents. And of course, the lawyer, and in that case, the attorney was myself, I had to undertake to the institution that when that process was completed, I would return the title. So I had to submit both the title of my client as well as the title of the neighboring land um, landowner to the title's office with the consent of mortgagee as well as the partial discharge of mortgage. And when the registrar of titles at the title's office received those documents, what the registrar did is to issue a third title for that small sliver of land right reflecting that that small sliver of land which is the subject of the encroachment now belongs to the neighbor right so there are many ways that you can resolve encroachments on your title um, there are many times however where it is not so simple you know um, neighbors might not want to acknowledge willingly or to pay any money for the encroachment that they have made on your land and it might become the subject of a lawsuit in those circumstances the process would not be um, any different the judge would make the order that um 
either the encroachment is removed or that it is resolved um, in some other way. So let me hear from you. Have you ever faced an encroachment by your neighbor? Do you have a mortgage on your title and your neighbor is encroaching on your land and you are unsure of how to address such a situation? Let me hear your question or your comments concerning this article which appeared in the news this week. Now, the main item on our menu, of course, at any time, if you wish to call in, your our local number is 876-453-1444. And if you're overseas, our international number is 954-338-7973. If you are just joining in, I am your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law, and you are listening to All Things Legal. So again, our numbers are 876-453-1444, or if you are overseas, 954 954- Three three eight seven nine seven three. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your feedback. So again, as I said, the main item that I want to look at this evening concerns the judgment of the full court, the constitutional court concerning this Keith Clark matter. We know that on May twenty seventh, two thousand and ten, Keith Clark who is the uncle of our current finance minister, Dr. Nigel Clark, was at home in Kirkland Heights, Red Hills. And it was a state of emergency, the security forces in a joint operation between the Jamaica Constabulary Force and the Jamaica Defense Force. They opened fire on his home. They cut off the grill to his home and they went inside and he suffered several gunshot wounds and ultimately he died. Now, let me just give a brief chronology of the events as they led up to this particular matter. As I said before, the incident happened on May 27, 2010. He was shot 21 times and he died in, in, inside of his Kirkland closed St. Andrew home. Okay. Um, then July 30, 2012. This is two years after the incident. Grace, that is not a matter that we can discuss. You can send in your number and um, we can have a discussion off air concerning that particular inquiry. So you can send in your number and or you can make inquiries regarding my number and we can talk about that matter off air. Now, again, moving, getting back to our program, on the 30th of July, 2012, the soldiers were charged for Clark's murder. On October 13th, 2013, the murder trial of the three soldiers were postponed until March 9, 2015, due to one of the defense lawyers falling sick due to chicken gunya. On March 9, 2015, the trial was rescheduled for October 12, 2015, after the Director of Public Prosecutions acceded to a request from attorneys for the soldiers that the trial be delayed pending the com- completion of the West Kingston Commission of Inquiry. Then, on October 12, 2015, the trial was rescheduled again to February 8, 2016, pending the completion of the West Kingston Commission of Inquiry. Then, on the 22nd of February, 2016, the then National Security Minister, Peter Bunting, signs and issues immunity certificates to Corporal Odell Buckley, Lance Corporal Greg Tinglin, and Private Arnold Henry. On September 19, 2016, the trial was pushed back to February 6, 
2017. September 2017, the trial was again delayed, this time because of the unavailability of Dr. Dinesh Rowe, the former consultant pathologist to the Ministry of National Security. And in April 2018, when the trial of the soldiers was set to begin, it was halted due to the presentation of certificates of immunity to the court. The widow of Keith Clark filed an application to the full court or the constitutional court concerning the constitutionality of these immunity or good faith certificates which were issued to the three soldiers con involved in the killing of Keith Clark. In November 2019, the Constitutional Court heard arguments in the challenge to the legality of these certificates of immunity or good faith. And then this week, on February 18th, 2020, the Constitutional Court ruled that the certificates of good faith or immunity were null and void and of no effect. I wish to underscore the point, though, that the National Security Minister, Peter Bunting, was not the minister at the time when the state of emergency was um, in, ex in existence in May 2010. And these good faith certificates were issued retroactively when a new government was formed um, at the time in 2016. Now, there are certain issues arising out of this judgment, this ruling. I think the court's mind was moved concerning the need to balance the emergency powers of the state. You know, um, in recent times, and the, 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 the Gleaners editorial this week on the 20th, um, this week, said that this judgment is quite timely because since last year we have seen the incidents of quite a number of states of emergency across this country in various parishes and it begs the question as to how the rights of individual citizens should be balanced against the rights of the state in circumstances where the crime rate in Jamaica is spiraling out of control and in circumstances where our security officers need would be seized of additional powers during these states of, states of emergency across our island to balance their powers against the rights of individual citizens. In this specific case, Mr. Keith Clark, who lost his life under a hail of bullets, 21 gunshot wounds in his home and the safety of his home. How do you feel about that, listeners? We're, we're going to be going into the meat of the judgment. But even in view of a state of emergency, how do you feel about the fact that the security forces were able to cut, remove the grill of this man's home? where he was living with his wife and his daughter. And they went in there, you know, um, the judgment of Justice Dunbar Green was very, very graphic. I imagined, you know, she mentioned that he was actually on top of a closet. He was hiding when the security forces came inside his home and he was, you know, disembarking the closet. And, um, you know, he faced these bullets you know, the, um, the government on its part said that they, they, they actually responded to fire, um, to, to gunfire. And um, it was under those circumstances that they entered Mr. Clark's home. Um, by way of context, you, you will remember that um, that state of emergency was precipitated by um, the issue concerning the extradition of Christopher Dodos Coke. The security forces were, 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 were in, um, in pursuit of him. There are some allegations that he might have been in the vicinity. We don't know. There are allegations. But the court was tasked to make a determination as to whether or not these good faith certificates, these good faith certificates 
the Minister of National Security at the time, Peter Bunting, indicated that the soldiers, they were properly exercising their functions as ministers, under, uh, as, as, as um, agents of the state, um, fully possessed of the authority of the state, and they had operated in good faith. And in those circumstances, they were granted those certificates, which would have accorded them an advantage in the prosecution of their case for the murder of Mr. Keith Clark. We're going to take a break here. You're listening to All Things Legal with your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. When we get back, we're going to look at some of the items, some of the issues that were ventilated and canvassed before the full court, the constitutional court this week in this judgment. And I want to hear your feedback. I want to hear your thoughts on this judgment. We'll be back in a few minutes. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Styles FM, Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Zane's Pharmacy is now open at shop number 8, Presa Plaza, Moran's Bay. We're here to satisfy all your pharmaceutical needs and more. Currently, we do free blood pressure checks and blood sugar testing, as well as HIV testing and counseling. Zane's Pharmacy, open Mondays to Saturdays, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And on Sundays, for your convenience, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Telephone 876-779-0006 or WhatsApp your prescriptions to 876 876- 855-6291. That's Zane's Pharmacy. Now open at shop number 8, Presa Plaza, Morant Bay. This is showing you the voice of Ja T. Your reggae ambassador. And we're talking about this big one. Yes, my show. It's all about Portland Black History Reggae Month. And it's all Reggae Showcase 2020. Taking place in Neville Antonio Park, Port Antonio, Portland. Saturday, February 22nd, 2020. Gates open at 10 a.m. Featuring the living legend himself, Mr. Dan Roy Morgan. The Jolly Boys will be there. Warrior King. St. Thomas coming a collective and all the acts will be there. Admission $300 before 4 p.m. $500 after 4. Donations will be accepted. Also a live outside broadcast of the Ja T. Show from 1 to 5 p.m. on the Saturday. This event is sponsored by Born to Win Entertainment, RiggyRoundTheWorld.com, Chati Entertainment, Colombina, Moving Taste Forward, DIB Hardware, Robinson Sons Hardware, Eastern Car Rental, Car Commander Parts, Axe Studio, Portland Credit Union, Portland Jewelers, Portland Municipal Corporation, and Tennis Stars. Remember, Reggae Showcase 2020, Saturday, February 22nd. I want to see your face on the plate. Hello? You have one minute, because on a Friday night, me have to tune in to Real Talk on Stars 96 FM. Me and you have questions about lovebirds and the bees. Not to mention the ticks and the fleas. So you try tune in on a Friday night between 9 and 12 for Real Talk. At a show where we discuss everything real and nothing ideal. Planning a party? Club night out, stage show, a gospel concert, or even a business sales event? Let Styles FM be a part of your promoting tool. Take advantage of our low price promotion packages with commercials, interviews, giveaways, reviews, and much more. We have special offers when you mix and match and bundle your options. Contact us at 876-286-9216 or 439-5160. Styles FM for the most effective way to exploit your marketing dollars. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Styles FM. Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Welcome back to All Things Legal with your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. Again, our numbers are 876-453-1444. And our international number is 954-338-7973. While we were in break, a question came in that inquiring whether 
all man-made laws are our subjects. Okay, bye, King. Thank you for being here. All man-made laws are subject to scrutiny and change. Well, indeed, um, you know, the common law, judge-made law, that's what the, the court rules on at all times, you know, even in this particular matter. Um, it was the emergency regulations of 2010, which were before the court and which were scrutinized, um, including the Constitution of Jamaica, to come to a determination as to whether or not um, the particular emergency regulations given rise to the power of the minister to grant those good faith certificates were in all the circumstances legal and could be upheld. Um, and be used by these um, soldiers in their trial. I see another question here coming in from Leo. He he asked, I don't remember the timeline, but were they issued before the investigation was done? And is such a thing constitutional? Now, um, I, I will not propose to offer my constitution my 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 opinion on this constitutional issue. I will simply weigh in on what the court decided. Um, but what I will say is that um, the good faith certificates were signed on February twenty second, two thousand and sixteen, but they were only presented in twenty eighteen, some eight years after. They were presented to the DPP eight years after the event which killed Mr. Keith Clark. They were signed by the security minister six years after the event giving rise to the death of Mr. Keith Clark. Right? So it was on that basis, in fact, as we will soon discover, that the court found that there were no unconstitutional and void in circumstances where the court felt like too much time had elapsed since the incident and the grant of the the certificates which made the trial unfair in all the circumstances and the court found that those certificates were indeed um unconstitutional um well they were null and void Th those um good faith certificates now there are three judges which com comprise the full court it was justice pusey justice Nem nemard and justice dunbar green now justice pusey and justice nemard were entirely agreed concerning the weight and the various issues which arose in this matter, Justice Pusey and Justice Nemard agreed that the power of Minister Bunting to issue these good faith certificates did not offend the doctrine of separation of powers. They also found that the certificates did not interfere with the power of the DPP to initiate or pursue action against members of the security for forces. And the certificates did not fetter the judiciary. Now, what does all of this mean? In Jamaica, we have three organs of the state. We have the legislature, which makes laws. We have the judiciary. And we have the executive. Right? Now... The question was whether or not the judiciary, since the court was now being required to weigh in in trial of these three soldiers, whether they were inhibited in any way in a fair trial of these men, given the interference as it was viewed by the claimant, the widow of Mr. Keith Clark, the interference of the minister by these immunity or these good faith certificates. I want to look at what these certificates say. Let's give an example of what these certificates say. But in the meantime, I want to hear your, your feedback. I want to hear your feedback concerning these good faith certificates. And if you've heard about this issue in the news, what are your thoughts on this judgment? I, this is what the good faith certificates said. I hereby certify that the actions of JDF Corporal Odell Carrington Buckley 
on May 27, 2010, between the hours of 12 a.m. and 12 p.m. at 18 Kirkland Close, Red Hill, St. Andrew, which may have contributed to or caused the death of Keith Clark, were done in good faith in the exercise of his functions as a member of the security forces for public safety, the restoration of order, the preservation of the peace, and in the public interest. The said actions were undertaken by the named member of the security forces during the existence of the emergency period declared by the proclamation number 6 of 2010 by the Governor General, May 23rd, 2010. So, this good faith certificate stated just that, that these soldiers were not actuated, they were not acting unlawfully, but they were done in good faith, they were not on a frolic of their own, but they were in exercise of their functions as existing members of the security forces for public safety, the restoration of order, and the preservation of the peace and in the public interest. But the court did not find that in the main that there was anything objectionable for the minister to have issued these certificates after the emergency period had expired because the emergency period expired in that same year, 2010. And the reason that they found so was that procedures may take some time. They might have had to do their investigations to come to a determination as to whether or not those soldiers acted lawfully or reasonable, in a reasonable manner, right? So the fact that they were issued after the relevant emergency period was not the reason that the court found that these certificates were unconstitutional. The reason that the court found that they were unconstitutional is because of the time. The time that it took for the court, for the, 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 um, the minister to sign them, and also the time that it took for defense counsel to bring it to the attention of the prosecution. There was a further point that was made before the court concerning whether or not these certificates in any way interfered with the power of the DPP to initiate or pursue action against these members of the security forces and whether or not the certificates fettered or inhibited the judiciary in the trial of these men. You know, when, when, when these certificates came before Justice Glenn Brown, when the trial was to, to be commenced concerning these soldiers, he halted the criminal proceedings and he indicated that he was not prepared to speak concerning the validity of these, cer um, these certificates. And he wished for the matter to be paused so that the matter could be ventilated before the full court or the constitutional court. And it was for this reason that the widow of Keith Clark brought this case before the full court or the constitutional court concerning um, these good faith certificates. You know, it is, it is very interesting because Justice Dunbar Green, she ultimately came to the, the same decision that the trial should continue in the matter of these three men. But the, the route that she took in coming to this decision was a little different from Justice Nemard and Justice Pusey. For she never made a determination that these certificates were invalid because she found that these certificates... I am seeing um, a, a, a caller writing in there. Um, I believe the soldiers were in fact carrying out an order which is a part of their duty. However, the fact that the order resulted in the death of an innocent citizen in the privacy of his home means someone has to be held accountable. 
I believe this is a general feeling of the Jamaican populace. Well, certainly in a number of quarters. That somebody has to be made accountable for the death of this man. It could have happened to you. It can happen to me. You know, um, but of course, these issues will will be ventilated when these men are ultimately tried. Of course, the Gleaner anticipated that an appeal, an appeal of this judgment is likely, given especially the fact that our government has been instituting quite a number of states of emergency. You know, um, you know during a state of emergency, uh, members of the Jamaica Defense Force, as well, as well as members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, they do have greater powers of, of, of arresting, of searching, you know, um, of movement than they do have ordinarily, which is why it is considered to be a state of emergency. They do have extended powers, which are emergency powers during this period. But this, th these powers are not unfettered. These powers must, must be demonstrated and proven to be done in good faith. In good faith. So these soldiers are not permitted to act unlawfully. Cassidy, are we getting some messages there? Okay. No. As I said before, the majority of the court found that it was the time that the minister decided to issue the certificates and in the circumstances of the case, when the soldiers were already indicted, right, um, that made the certificates null and void. Now, there was a dissenting judgment by Justice Marcia Dunbar-Green and she indicated that the defendant soldiers in that case had no control over whether or when a certificate was issued, the date of the request for one or the length of time for internal procedures, political considerations, and any number of variables can bear upon that question. Hmm? So Justice Dunbar Green did not find that there was anything objectionable in either the time that it took for the minister to sign or the time that it took for it to be um for it to be issued by the minister in all the circumstances she found that there are various issues that could have um contributed to the um to these certificates being issued um some six years six years after the incident um took place the court also found that there was nothing objectionable concerning the fact that the certificates were issued after the state of emergency had come to an end. But apparently, the time that it was issued was too inordinate. Uh, okay. We are trying to, uh, to rectify that issue, um, Leo, so that you can you can be able to tune in to hear everything that we're saying on this program. We're sorry that you're having those technical difficulties. So what do you think, listeners? How do you feel about this issue concerning this matter? This case brings into view the need for balance during these states of emergency. Um... It brings into question how far, how far is too far that our security forces can go in exercising their emergency powers during um, these states of emergency. Of course, these, um, even though they're considered to be immunity certificates, the court found that these immunity certificates were not the end of the matter. What the immu Im immunity certificates did, the court found, was now it, it placed a burden on the DPP to now prove that even though the minister stated that these men had acted in good faith, she would now have to gather evidence to show that these men did not in fact 
act in good faith. I don't know the considerations that the DPP or the investigative arm, what they will uncover, uncover and I will not even try to um, speculate concerning those things. Suffice it to say, the court has decided that the trial of this matter must go on, but those good faith certificates should not be used and should not be brought to bear. They are considered to be null and void. So the soldiers can no longer avail themselves of these good faith certificates. But it remains to be said, though, listeners, that there is no bar to any minister of national security in the future issuing good faith certificates for any member of our security forces where in circumstances where they acted under a state of emergency resulting in a death of any citizen of Jamaica. They are permitted, they are permitted to do so. They are permitted to do so. The very narrow issue in which the court found against these soldiers concerned the time, the length of time, the length of time that it took. Leo is here saying that he agrees that the time that had lapsed makes it suspicious. You know, um, the Clark family is quite gratified by this, um, this judgment of the full court, the constitutional court. The constitutional court, the full court, it's three sitting judges of the Supreme Court who sat and weighed on um, these constitutional issues concerning um, the constitutionality of these immunity certificates, right? Um, now, I still want to hear from you listeners. I still want to hear from you and whether or not you believe that soldiers should be granted immunity certificates in circumstances. Do you believe that it, it tips the scales too much in favor of our, um, our security forces to be granted immunity certificates? You know, um, one of the, the points that was raised by Justice Dunbar Green is that um, during states of emergencies, because it's very extreme circumstances, very peculiar circumstances, if members of our security forces believe that they might be at risk of prosecution, it might have a chilling effect on their morale, on their ability to, um, to, do, to do their duties during these states of emergencies. You know, um, so certainly there has to be a balance a balance, a balance um, between, you know, in the scales concerning the rights of individual citizens and the powers of the state. I see another listener writing in. We're looking forward to hearing your comment. Now, I wanted to, to kind of give you an idea of um, some of the considerations which came about concerning this Emergency um, Powers Act. Um, can the soldiers be pardoned under our laws? Yes, the soldiers can be pardoned, but the soldiers would have to be pardoned after conviction. After conviction, or um, it, it would not be constituted as a pardon, but the DPP can enter what is called a nolly prosecution. Prosic, um, meaning that she enters no prosecution. Whether whether the evidence is so skeletal is so limited. I see your your. I'm answering your question. Then, um, you know, she considers the evidence to be so little that she makes a determination that she will not um, prosecute these soldiers based on the evidence which is before her. But the governor general does have power after a conviction, I believe under section 90 or so of the constitution to grant a pardon, right? Um, for those of us who are just tuning in, you are listening to all things legal 
on Styles FM with your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. If you want to um, send in your questions or comments, our numbers are 876 453 1444. That is 876 453 1444. And our international number is 954 338 7973. Now, I see Leo here writing in. It sets the wrong example to our security forces that they may have a get-out-of-jail-free card. But if it can be shown that they acted in good faith, then a pardon may be issued. Exactly. After a court hearing, it would make sense. I suppose he's, he's responding to the issue of the Governor General granting a pardon um, after a conviction is made. But Section 3 of this Emergency Powers Act, I wanted to look at this provision because I think it's important in view of um, the, criminal situ the crime situation that we're experiencing in this country that we understand. We understand the, 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 um, the remit of these emergency powers, you know, of the state. Now, it says, this particular act said that during a period of public emergency, it shall be lawful for the governor general by order to make regulations for securing the essentials of life to the community. And those regulations may confer or impose on any government department or any persons in Her Majesty's service or acting on Her Majesty's behalf such powers and duties as the governor general may deem necessary or expedient for... Listen to these now. The preservation of the peace for securing and regulating the supply and distribution of food. Are you hearing that, Leo? Water, fuel, light, and other necessities for maintaining the means of transit or locomotion and for any other purposes essential to the public safety and life of the community. So in a state of emergency... The state can control food, water, fuel, light, and other necessities, as well as transit, travel. Us who live in Kingston and even those um, out west, we know the various states of emergency you're passing through Chelani. St. Catherine has faced quite a number, a number of... Um, a number of errors had um, checkpoints even right now, I, I believe um, Raytown or somewhere in that region has one. I see a comment come in here. Justice must be served, but I think that Bishop should be hold, hold, held, held accountable. Who is Bishop? Oh, a call is coming in. Can we hear that caller? I see another person um, rising in. If the soldiers are pardoned, what justice is there for the family? A caller is online. Yes, caller. Caller is online. You're online. It's disconnected. Okay, you can try again, caller. If the soldiers are pardoned, what justice is there for the family? That's a very good question, um, Mrs. Johnson, um, and this particular ruling by the full court has implications for the family because the family um, also instituted a civil suit um, indicating that the soldiers were, were guilty of um, trespass to the person, um, you know, um, malfeasance, negligence, and they were bringing um, a claim under the Fatal Accidents Act. Um, um, for a claim for the life of their family member. This was brought by the widow of Keith Clark, um, Claudette Clark, as well as her daughter, Brittany, um, who were both present at the time when uh, Mr. Clark was killed. Um, soldiers armed, trained to kill, and based on how we were told the man was killed after hiding in his closet, I don't see the threat there. It's very unfair. That's a very legitimate point, um, listener. Um, it, it truly um, really was very um, painful to read that account concerning the circumstances of the death of Mr. Clark. The fact that, um, you know, he was literally on top of his closet. Um, that, you know, that, that raises the issue of whether or not these soldiers really were acting in good faith. 
it does not appear that they were acting in good faith. But I, I want to I want you guys to understand that these emergency powers of the state they are so wide. They are so wide. It's something that we need. We we need to understand how wide these powers are and how much they um they restrict the individual rights of citizens in this country. Issues of food, water, fuel, light, transport, you know, matters of safety. Um, are you prepared to give up those rights for the whole? Or should the government um, be more interested in, in, in more sustainable means of curbing crime in this country? Does Jamaica have a wrongful death law like the United States of America? Um, well, the, the, the family brought the claim under the fatal, fatal, um, I, I, I beg your pardon. I, the, the family brought a, a claim under the Fatal Accidents Act in circumstances where um, a person died as a result of the negligence of some purported negligence of someone else. You know, um, so that that is what they were claiming, that they breached Mr. Clark's right to life, his right to protection of private property, the right not to be treated in a degrading and inhumane manner in contravention of the constitution of jamaica so in view of this this particular ruling by the constitutional court this civil case is likely now to go on um granted that these immunity certificates are now rendered void so it will not assist these soldiers these soldiers in in this matter who determines what is the public good <laughs> Who determines what is the public good? That is really a, 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 a good question. That is a good question. Um, you know, the court found... The court never weighed too much in terms of whether or not the public good was being served in this particular case, except to say that the emergency powers regulations were in effect. But the, the matter of public good is something that Perhaps we can discuss further at another time, especially since time is upon us. Because some persons might not consider that um, the public good is served if individual rights are so abridged and so limited um, by the agents of the state. I, 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 I very much believe, Leo, that um, the Clark's family would, would likely be of the view that the public good was not served in this episode which took the life of their father and husband and uncle and friend indeed a son of jamaica um we are at the end of all things legal thank you for joining in um we had a caller who was disconnected i hope that um you will try again next week i am your host janine lang attorney at law it was my pleasure to share with you Join me again next week for All Things Legal, All Things Being Equal. Let's see you next week. I want to see that final um, listener before I go. The, so the, soldiers, the soldiers were working from orders. Therefore, the one who gives the order should stand trial. And this is from a concerned citizen. Um, well, you know, I believe that um, you are correct, um, listener. Um, as far as it as it concerns the um, the 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 civil suit, um, Miss Mrs. Claudette um, Clark, as well as her daughter, is bringing a a claim against the government of Jamaica through the Attorney General of Jamaica, who um, would really represent the, the state in this particular matter. So, so there would really be a claim against the government in those circumstances as well. Yes, it. Um, I think you need a longer show. Okay, Leo, um, I, I will have to talk to Styles about that. Um, but I really appreciate all of your comments and your feedback, and I, I will. I look forward to seeing you again next week. All things being equal, join me next week for all things legal. Janine Lang, attorney at law. Take care. Until then, bye bye. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. 
All Things Being Equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you All Things Legal on Styles FM, Fridays 4 p.m. to 5 p.m.